And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I, I have two newcomers into the temple, part of the double-headed monster that is Eren Chronicles, currently kickstarting Exordium, Origins of Mythos, which we'll be getting into t today, tonight, whichever time zone it is where you are. <laughs> in, the in the red corner, we have Nicholas um, Totif. And in the blue corner, we have George um, Svendorakis. I'm hoping I got it close with, th with those. How are you two doing tonight? Uh, fine. A uh, wonderful intro. <laughs> Fine, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that sadly the third head of the Aaron Chronicles couldn't make it here tonight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know how it is with a Hydra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, with that said, I like to open these kind of things with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So. I'd like you two to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Well, my first exposure was... Um, it's it's not as much time as people would think. Um, it was 10, 11 years ago when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And uh, first year. And uh, a friend of mine just asked me if I wanted to play Dungeons & Dragons. I didn't because in Greece it's not that big. It is big, but it is a pretty, it's pretty niche. Uh, I didn't know exactly what it was when he explained uh, what it is. I got it from you know uh, pop culture references, etc. And I was very hyped because I'm a very big gamer and uh, I like I like role playing games. <clears throat> and uh, we played actually second edition. Uh, Thaco and the rest of the cursed, uh, <laughs> you know, ensemble. And uh, I really liked it. Uh, it was, you know, I, I immediately fell in love with it. It was amazing to me that you could have so many, you know, you could do anything, basically, within the sum of the rules of the game. And um, that friend, after a while, uh, gave up on running sessions because he got bored or something. And that gave me, you know, I, I, I got the bug. <laughs> and... The, I I started researching how I could um, I could be a DM myself, and I was looking a lot to find other people to play. Uh, it took me I think about six or seven months. As I, first time I played, it was fifth edition. First time I DM'd, I mean, and uh, it was you know pretty pretty random. We used to add proficiency bonus on our armor class because we were proficient with the armor <laughs> or we used to add pro our proficiency bonus on our damage rolls instead of our attack rolls because we basically couldn't hit anything but when we, <laughs> we landed a hit it was big yeah so that's basically how i got into role playing games it was dnd second edition later on fifth and now i try to branch out to as many things as i can yeah and um Although it is fun, it is funny going from a, going from AD and D to fifth because some thing some things haven't changed. Like say, the ranger being the unluckiest man in the room. <laughs> True. Um, if if anything, in the AD and D days, it was worse. It's there's never been any proof of it, but it's speculated that because of the way rangers worked in the early days, that's the reason why the at death's door rules started to show up. Oh, okay. Because, uh, because of how because rangers couldn't equip back then. Rangers could not equip um, the more, the more metallic armors, and because of the way armor worked with how Thaco worked, they could they they could get taken out very very easily because they because they were so easy to hit. And, uh huh. And because of that, ranger down became a running joke for years okay very interesting oh uh, like i i've never gotten confirmation if that's the reason if um that played a factor 
I'm just I'm just saying that if if it was, I could, I would just nod and say yeah that yeah that tracks. Sounds plausible. And well, the Ranger in fifth edition has gone through in the in since release has gone through like five or six different revisions. I know that Morals said it keeps insisting that there's nothing wrong with the Ranger. People just aren't playing it right, but um. We, but we are in a free country, and he is free to be wrong. <laughs> Fair enough. So, um, what about you, George? What about what was your introduction? Mm. Well, I've always been a fan of fantasy and a fan of making up adventures every time I had free time. Mm. So, about 20 years back... I was in uh, the local hobby shop waiting for my father to buy his Magic the Gathering cards and try to persuade me to join tournaments again. <laughs> and I was just perusing the books and happened upon the player's handbook of uh, the third edition. I just read the back cover and was like, hold on a minute. That's exactly what I've been doing with all my free time. Someone put rules around this. <laughs> and... Haven't stopped DMing ever since. <laughs> yeah, the the call of the forever DM is a siren song. <laughs> it's a curse we must bear with honor. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, of course. By the t by the time I realized that I'd become a forever DM, it, it was far too late because I had too I had too many books and I became the the guy regar regarding it. Um, of course, of course, even of course, even with that, I think the other reason it did it I didn't mind being the forever DM was um ev was um the kind of players who would pull who would pull ridiculous stunts wouldn't do that around me because of the punishment game that I would put that would put people through. Um, Specifically, the fact that if you did, if you tried to pull something like that at the table, you had to drink what was known as the pain glass. Oh wow! It is it is a shot glass filled with water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, um, th three or four different three or four different hot sauces, and ground up jalapeno seeds. <laughs> Sounds like uh, you make a Constitution saving throw real life when you drink that. Yeah, the idea was make was make the punishment so much more worse than the crime that nobody would think it would even um, want to think about trying to t trying to tempt fate. Sometimes, uh, of course, of course, sometimes I'll be nice and give them option B, which is drink a bottle of bacon soda. Americans have that. <laughs> Uh, baking soda or bacon soda? <laughs> bacon. B A C O N. Oh, okay. B bacon. Okay, I had right. <laughs> it is absolutely disgusting, and that's the point. It sounds very disgusting. <laughs> yeah, but if I'm go if if it's supposed to be a punishment game, I'm not going to give them something nice. Yeah, fair enough. But now, when it comes to exordium, um. The first thing that the first thing that came to that got my attention was the was the introduction of of mythic paths and now mythic paths is is not something is not something new new to me the I'd say one I'd say one of the big um one of the bit one of the big purveyors of it was in more recent years has been the mythic system in Pathfinder. And I'm curious if that was an influence in the development of Exordium. That was certainly a large influence. Uh, from the first time we met the system in, uh, I think it was Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous, mm -hmm. the whole idea of embodying an arc a personal arc and growing to something extraordinary through your own trials. It was something that 
drew many of us to the concept itself. While we decided to take a different approach in how to incorporate them, Pathfinder's Mythic Path certainly were an inspiration regarding that. Yeah. And I think the I think the other the other thing that I find majorly interesting with this approach of the, of this mythos tier adve- adventuring is there's been a narrative for the past several years, one that I've been critical of, of this idea that high level play in D and D is not interesting, and that that's the reason, and it's for that reason I'm glad that that you guys are working on this because you and you've probably seen that narrative as well. This idea, this idea that D and D gets boring once you're it once you're in the mid teens, um, level wise. But I will always argue that the that the reason that the reason for that is a is a lack of is more a lack of support than a than anything else. Um, did you have you guys had had that particular issue of um, of the of interest dropping off at high levels because the the ne- you have the nemesis monsters which are a CR of of sixteen and higher. Yeah, yeah, so it's in... yeah. Go ahead, Nikos. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so, well, we we are definitely aware of this effect. I think it happens mostly to inexperienced parties, because at one point, the, because the the party is bloated with items and you know homebrew things or whatever, um, the DM does not actually know how to handle that uh, if they are not a very experienced DM. And uh, that's where it gets a bit sidetracked, and it's easier to keep track of combat on lower levels. Coupled with exactly what you said, that there's not been much support for high-level gameplay, uh, co- and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the only campaign uh, or adventure for 5th edition that goes to up to 20 levels is uh, Dungeon of the Mud Mage. Um, there's, a few I thi- third, there's a few third parties, mm-hmm. but, not a ho- but not a whole lot. Yeah, and um, we knew that because we wanted to make something that's epic in both scope and feeling and mythical, we would have to delve into high-level gameplay. And uh, this uh, came up more like a challenge and something that we would very much like to get correctly rather than something that scared us. Um, We believe that there should be more content for high-level, and uh, I think that we managed to find a very good balance with giving a lot of flavor through the mythic paths because the mythic paths are not broken in and of themselves. They do make the player stronger, but they don't make them a god. Um, and I think that we balanced that out very well with the mythic monsters and the mythic uh, nemesis. Uh, I th- at least that's my take. I, I'd love to also hear, you know, George more formed opinion on this. <laughs> well, there are a couple of thoughts when mentioning high-level campaigns, especially in 5th edition. As you said, it's quite challenging sometimes to build an adventure for high level, especially with the multiple abilities and tools characters have there. However, high-level adventures are, or at least can be, very, very interesting. It is the point where the players have enough strength to actually shape the world around them. Mm -hmm. And with their actions, create cascading reactions throughout their plane. So it can create very powerful moments that are sadly seldom explored. Now, it is worth mentioning that Exordium has been created to explore that epic narrative uh, regardless of level, really. Yes, the nemesis are quite strong and do promote that you um, reach a high level in your campaign and the legacy system introduced actually advises the DM on how to get there with an interesting story. 
uh, but the content itself can be used even at low levels to introduce this epic mythic feeling uh, quite early, make the players feel unique quite early, and create a more epic narrative starting from levels 4 and 5 if you need to. So, so with that, with that said, <coughs> uh, I'd say the, I'd say one of the, one of the first things to come, to come to mind is, um, kind, is kind of the, uh, kind of the, um, overall framework of how, a, of how a mythic path is going to work within this particular system. Specific, specifically, um, the pattern of be, of not just becoming one, but how one advances within it. And I'm I'm aware that that's going to be that's going to vary between paths. But I just mm -hmm. I just want to I just wanted to get kind of a baseline before we got into some of the specific paths um, wholesale. Yeah, certainly. So, the way mythic paths are incorporated. Uh, the easiest way to explain it is like it's a subclass, regardless of your own class, that you get in addition to anything else you have. For example, you might be an Abjurer Wizard, and at some point you gain the Lich Mythic Path. Mm -hmm. Now that Mythic Path gains you a couple of features, up to five to be exact, depending on how far along you are which are designed to give you more options, at the very least, on how to use your powers more flavorfully. Mm -hmm. They are designed in a way that doesn't make, it, doesn't make the other players obsolete. So should a player decide to use Mythic Paths and the other characters do not have... only one character has a Mythic Path, the others don't feel left out. Though you can create some really strong narratives if you include more than one. Mm -hmm. Now, the way they develop is not through experience points. We wanted each mythic path to tell a story, to embody this folklore, and promote personal character development arcs. So in order to keep things separate, we opted to have Mythic Paths evolve through Mythic Trials. These are difficult things that you can achieve that progress your own story and also move you up along the Mythic Path. Mm -hmm. I should give an example uh, in order to make it easier to understand. So, for example, you might join the Death Knight Mythic Path. <laughs> From a fledgling, in order to progress, you have three trials available for you, or anything else similar the DM might cook up. And one such example would be that you have to find and corrupt a holy or good magical item. So you promote the fantasy of the Death Knight corrupting the world around them and trying to share their darkness or make it in their own image for their own personal uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. We have ensured that each mythic path and their trials can be attempted by almost any character. So, apart from mythic paths such as the Lich, where you need to be a caster, you won't find anything else telling you that you need to adhere to a specific style of play. Mm -hmm. We want these mythic paths to help create more stories to tell around the table. And we're really excited to see what the people come up with, really. Mm -hmm. And I'm get and I'm guessing with the with within each within each one thing that I noticed within the um preview was the was um several 
was well, well, several ev several types of events that could be used as a way to get someone into the path. I.e., as as mentioned, when we when we were setting up all all roads leading to Rome, that be that the types being birthright, destiny, gift, inheritance, and relic. <clears throat> and obvious, obviously, each of those is go is going to be a different approach. But I'm I'm guessing that's to make sure that there is that um someone taking on one of the mythic paths isn't doing it the exact same way every every single time. Yeah, um, they are also there. They are for what you said that you know we want a fresh experience whenever a player plays a mythic path and. As a, a bonus to that, we also included the mythic talents for that, but you know we can talk about them later. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the origin story is basically there to help you uh, construct your own fantasy of what it means to be a death knight or an exemplar or a prophet or whatever. And um, <clears throat> it, it also works so that the the DM can bestow them upon you in a certain way, or if you can weave them in your own backstory, you are certainly not limited to this. You can um, these are mostly examples that we felt encompass the feeling of its mythic path. Um, but that's the primary role to help you with e evocative uh, images and. Um, you know, give you a direction of how we envision uh, every mythic path. But, of course, you can take that and do whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. Now, to put it to put it all in context, I'd like to play a little bit of word association with you guys. Um, since you have the um, descriptions of the 10 mythic paths on the Kickstarter page, I'm going to go through them, and I'd like you to give me a character in f a character in fiction. It can be from uh, it can be from other RPGs. It can be from books. It can be from film. It can be from te television. It can be from comics. What have you? Just a a character from fiction that you th that you think is a good representative of that particular mythic path. Okay. All right. So I I'll start with the A's seed. Um, I think the AC, um, I think it's also pronounced AC, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> um, it's, ga it's Gaelic. Gaelic is weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if, it, if, there's, if we introduced this mythic path uh, specifically because we felt that there wasn't um, too much representation of that. They are touched by the Fae, and that's, you know... Um, more of um, of their unique element. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and someone does not come to mind right now that could represent the AC. Uh, do you have something, George? Uh, I don't have something specific in uh, fiction, uh, at least not well-known fiction. The origins of that was trying to understand some of the more Irish folklore stories and try to envision the faith through them. Mm -hmm. So that's what we wanted to achieve with the acid. Um, but I, I can't correlate it to a movie or a book, for example, specifically. That's well known, really. I suppose, I suppose the best analogy that I could come up with personally, based just based on what I've seen, is the two characters in a um, PS3 game called Folklore. Oh, putting aside that that one's also leaning heavily into Irish myth, <coughs> the you the con it deals with the concept of a tra a traveler to these various versions of the Netherworld. And the Fae folk with it within it, um, that's the that's the big one that comes to mind for me. I it, it that one is a little bit tricky, 
But the next one I think I think is a little bit le would be a little bit less tricky, and that is the Colossus. The main example that we use for the Colossus, even amongst ourselves, is basically Samson mm -hmm. um, from uh, from the Bible, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> um, yeah, the 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 man who had a very who had a, you know ex exceptional strength. Um, he was a legendary warrior, and um, he, the power that he had derived from his uncut hair. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is also implemented in the Colossus uh, as um, more of an optional rule, I'd say, that you can come up with your own weakness. Um, and of course, uh, the Colossus is, is, um, is Hercules. Uh, these are, I think, the, the two biggest inspirations moving forward with how we would create uh, this specific mythic path. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the now you you already dipped into the dis some of the descriptions with the Death Knight, but that's the next one on the list. So I'll so I'll ask about that one. Well, I think uh, an obvious one, uh, because the Death Knight is already a, a huge figure in uh, D&D, through Lord Soth and similar creatures, um, I think that's the, the biggest um, inspiration we had. And of course, you can go to World of Warcraft and say um, Arthas, the Lich King. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that would be my, you know, my most, uh, co my biggest correlation with them. Two big figures, two pretty well-known figures. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly the way that we mean that mythic paths can often be interpreted in different ways. For example, for me, when uh, we were creating it, a good example would be... Uh, Elric of Melibone. Nice. From the... Eternal <clears throat> Champion. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought of him as a Death Knight. Uh, I recently actually started reading uh, Elric. But it, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, the... Th and I, I suppose I suppose if I'm, if if that if that route is going to be taken, I could also I could also bring in two characters that were heavily inspired by the world of Elric, and that that being Raziel and Cain from the Legacy of Cain games. Yeah, you really bring me back right now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, I I do style myself a bit as a as a historian, so. There, so there is certainly that. But <clears throat> next would be the demoniac. My take on the demoniac and what I envisioned while you know coming up with some of the abilities. Of course, everyone had a, a dip in everything, <laughs> but um, I had the, the the Devil May Cry characters in my mind. Uh, specifically, um, more of Dante and Nero, uh, not so much Virgil. Um, the the fact that they have a demonic limb uh, gave me a lot of inspiration to write things about that, and that's basically what the demonic does. He uh, he he gets some influence from the abyss and changes physically. Mm -hmm. oh. That would be my yeah. I guess you. I guess you weren't motivated enough to add, to add Virgil's kit to the mix. Sorry, yeah, I think I think Virgil does not. Uh, I specifically avoided him because I I think he, he does not lean that much to the um, to the demon side. Uh, he mostly feels like a very proficient swordsman to me. Well, of course, not when they go butt insane and they just uh, <laughs> go full demon forms. Yeah, but that was I. I mostly had the Devil Bringer in my mind and things like that. Yeah, I, I can cert I can certainly see it. I just I had um I had to embrace the meme. 
Yeah, definitely. Oh. Especially, especially given that one of... Th those kind of hybrids, there's a game in my library that I... That I've covered recently. That's all. That's all about that. Um, called all of their strengths, because originally it was a. Tr it was spent meant to be a nod to the Wesley Snipes Blade. Uh, you know, all of their strengths, none of their weaknesses. Yeah. Nice. Oh. Uh, but next would be the exemplar. Well. For me. Okay, go ahead, George. Uh, the exemplar is quite uh, a unique take, I'd say, because it represents, in a way, the half celestial path, many would say, half angel, mm -hmm. um, which is something that we've seen a lot in uh, many tales and video games, especially. But it's in a way the way that we would want to envision this. Uh, considering what does it actually mean to be as good as you can? And how do you avoid things that are often shown in uh, pop culture? Such as the angels being too lawful and too good and actually being blinded by that. How does it feel to approach true goodness without being at fault, yet while being a mortal who is flawed, so they can only try to approach this as best they can? Mm -hmm. um, while it... Um, While it's not uh, a great fantasy celestial example, I'd say the closest uh, inspiration for that for me was uh, Dalinar from the Starlight Chronicles. Uh, the image of a man who tries to follow a code that he believes is above everything, but ultimately finds a lot of hardship in order to do that and must overcome his mortality to approach the example that he has set upon, he, upon himself. Mm -hmm. If I could add a more visual, because I've not read uh, that book uh, yet, but if I could add a more visual guide for me, that would be Tyrael from Diablo. Because yeah. he, he, he has that angelic... Um, vision but he does not have the heavenly wings uh, and we we try to to keep um, the exemplar in a more of a neutral uh, field as you can see even from the artwork when the one wing is uh, black the other is you know white um, yeah that's that's what I wanted to add mm -hmm. and I, I can certainly see it and well, it's interesting that you bring up Tyrio because he's he's supposed to be the angel of justice, but his interpretation of what is justice um is part is part of what gets him in in um trouble. Yeah, that was why I'm, you know, I leaned on the visual aspect of Tyrell. <laughs> And I I know some pe I know some people really hate Diablo three, but um that provided a go a good follow up arc for him. You know, ta taking his wings off and becoming human because of that belief in justice. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but next would be the Hellspawn, and well, the well Al Simmons is the name that immediately. <laughs> Propped up in my head when I saw that, but I'm not sure if that's what you guys um, had in mind. I'm sorry. Would you repeat the name? I'm not familiar with it. Is it Al Spawn? Yes. Okay. Um, I think uh, you know Spawn George from Marvel. Yes, I'm familiar not, with not Spawn Marvel. from Marvel. 
that Marvel <laughs> game. Oh, pay. sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're right. Uh, yeah, uh, so I don't think that um, Spawn carries, a, or Al Simmons, carries a very um, strong presence. Um, he's physical. I'm not too familiar with, with Spawn. I've seen some of... Uh, his toolkit, but what we wanted to encapsulate with Hellspawn was more of the cunningness and the silver tongue that the devil possesses. Um, something that I could equate um, the Hellspawn in my mind is uh, Crowley from Supernatural, for example. Uh, the devil of the crossroads that makes deals um, that always favors him and he gets your soul. Um, so that would be my take. On um, the Hellspawn. Yeah. Uh, in so more more of the more of the silver tongues, more of the de more of the deal maker than than um, somebody who's <clears throat> meant to be Hell's soldier. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We wanted to try a different approach from the demoniac. Apart from the lawful versus chaos part, mm -hmm. this helps to differentiate the roleplay aspects quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, I mean, we really wanted to give players a reason to say that you've got to read the fine print. Mm -hmm. Oh, but and I'm guessing this is the one you get. You guys were thinking would be would it would be ideal for me. Um, the jester. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. So mm -hmm. go ahead. The George. jester. I really don't know with what to equate it. So, uh, a force of chaos ruling that, in the end a joke against all the other beings that try to put the whole plane into motion. Mm -hmm. A joke against the grand plans of creatures like high-end uh, archdevils or deities who want to put things on the right path. Mostly, a force of balance against those that try to tame the world to their own whims. So it's, I think that it's the most fun we've had creating a mythic path, especially during the trials that represent that force of chaos being brought upon the world and have a very, very unique take on uh, how you can progress upon the path and how you can pull these jokes against the DM eventually. I would, s <clears throat> as far, I would say that a that characters who are trying to embody the phantom thief archetype would probably be a natural fit for the jester. Uh, I don't think that I would take it to these uh, because his um, his toolkit is more like. A very powerful, and it, it's pretty funny because the first thing that comes to mind always is Mr. Mime from Pokemon, <laughs> because his toolkit is creating um, invisible weapons or fooling you in uh, thinking you stabbed him or them, but you instead have stabbed yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't think that he has the the uh, that much of um, yeah. I wouldn't equate him. Or them with um, a fandom thief. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I can I can see what I can see what you mean on that front. And the the next one on the list is is of course the lich. Yeah, I think the lich is already a very prominent uh, figure. Um, in, um, in especially in D and D, mm -hmm. and um, I think that um, there is not a specific lich that we drew 
that much of an inspiration from. We obviously wanted to encapsulate the the ability of having a phylactery and uh, how a leech works in um, in D and D already. Um, if I had to choose a character, does one come to mind, George? A specific character? Specific character? I'd say leeches from other media, such as Kel'Thuzad from Blizzard's games. Yeah, but that's enough. already pretty much a copy of the D&D leech. <laughs> Davy Jones. Mm. Mm, I don't think that they sell the same toolkit. I see, although, a very interesting take on being a leech. Uh, it is a flavor that uh, I personally uh, did not consider. consider. And um, I think that's the amazing thing that we will get to experience once Exordium is out to people's hands. We will get um, ideas like a David Jones leads <laughs> uh, that gets me excited, you know, to, to see someone play that. Um, but I wouldn't say that it will, uh, we considered, at least I didn't consider David Jones on that. But it's a very good idea. I mean, his... Uh... <clears throat> His he he ha putting aside the fact that the that he has control over the dead who have to serve on the on the flying Dutchman. You have the fact that he that the only way to take him out is by, is by stabbing the his heart, which is kept which is kept in a in a chest tin hidden. Um, if that's not a phylactery, I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I've got to say, it's a great example. It's exactly the type of things that I would like to see. A character making, for example, a rogue or a fighter that's elites and embodying the whole concept in a different manner than what's usual. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, the Prophet. The Prophet... I think there's a lot of folklore that uh, uh, um, explores the idea of having visions and leading the uh, and leading the story through them. Um, I would say that the closest I can, th I can think is what the three-eyed raven from Game of Thrones should have been. <laughs> <laughs> nice correction there. <laughs> If I could uh, add some names on that list, I think that um, Morgan Le Fay uh, could be a good example, um, you know, from Arthurian myth. And uh, also the three witches, or the weird sisters of Shakespeare in Macbeth. Um, maybe even at some point, I'm not too big on Dune, but from what I have understood, I think that these flashing visions of the future uh, that Leto, Leto Atreides has, or Paul Atreides, sorry, Paul, yeah, um, is pretty much um, uh, something that you will get to experience as a prophet uh, in our game. Because we, we wanted to differentiate between long-term prophecies, a king will come someday from the lake, and the short-term prophecies, which is basically, I just avoided your attack, or, <laughs> you know, some things like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the last one is the Warlord. Uh, for the Warlord, I think uh, we lean heavily on themes such as conquering. Mm -hmm. well, well, I don't think, I know, <laughs> you know. Um... And I, I, I feel that this is embodied very well through, um, if I'm going to go to popular fiction, I would go for a character like uh, Ragnar from the Viking series. Um, or similar, you know, similar um, conquerors. Mm -hmm. oh. I Do would you... say that uh, only considering the conqueror part, is a bit limiting for yeah, me definitely. a great example would be what you mentioned earlier from fiction of, of paul atreides so a 
eventually very charismatic uh, individual who can inspire leadership and inspire people to follow under them for a great cause. If I could add another name that I think really fits how I would play a warlord, it's Griffith from Berserk, um, which embodies that cunning uh, um, tactician, mastermind, a charismatic fig- figure. Mm-hmm. Um, would you consider le- would you consider legendary full on strategist like say Juge Leon? As as fitting within that archetype, I think I'm not familiar. Um, Zhuge Liang, Liang, he's fr- he's ah Zhuge he's, Liang, okay, yeah, okay, from Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Ah, okay, okay. Well, I think uh, I I'm not too familiar off the top of my, of my head. I think I know the person as. Um, wasn't he an advisor or something? Uh, or ad- and um, and chief strategist. Yeah, I think you can. Uh, you know, the um, after you get uh, the mythic paths in your hands, they can uh, embody your own fantasy as you see fit. I it, it's uh, something that I didn't um, because I always had uh, the warlord in my mind as also a fighter. And because they have things, uh, you know, their features give them uh, some fighting abilities. Uh, I didn't consider them as mostly a tactician, mathematical genius or (laughs) whatever. Um, But I think it could work. Um, I'm not sure if Zhuge Liang um, had the ability to fight as well. I would say that it could work greatly. It is for things like this that we included some uh, extra abilities that characters can pick, the mythic talents, so that they can create exactly what they want through the mythic path. Mm -hmm. And in this case, create the brilliant strategist and roleplay that most. Yeah, because when it comes to... And I am... It is kind of amusing to see to to when I keep seeing incarnations of the warlord archetype, um, given how I was I was one of those heretics who enjoyed um, some of the things that fourth edition had brought, and that include that included the concept of the of the warlord, which was meant to be this frontline com- frontline commander who had the party at had the party as his weapon of choice instead of a, instead of a partic- a particular um equipment um the and and ever ever since I've seen people try to bring that into 5th edition because I suppose it scratched an itch that people didn't know that they had I think that 4th edition is very much um is is shamed <laughs> too much and that act attacked too much. Uh, it had some very nice concepts that, especially as a game designer, we can draw inspiration from. Uh, specifically, I, th- I I could be wrong because I you know I could be confusing some abilities, but I think the warlord had an ability that they could rush out to help an ally, and depending on how many attacks of opportunity they provoked. They got a bonus, I think, either to their AC or to helping the fallen ally or something like that. And mechanics like that, um, while they may appear more gamey, they are very interesting because they are very fresh. Nothing like that is in fifth edition, as far as I know. Uh, and as far as far as things being too gamey, um, you're playing a game. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Like yeah. The, the the claim about it being too about it being too video gamey or, or the like just reminds me of um of the issue I've had with the sim with the sim racing genre where where people are trying to um spend way too much time to try and make it at make it as much like a simulation of of real world motorsport to the detriment of everything else, especially since most people aren't going. 
it's focusing on things that most people aren't going to care about, like the like like the proper curvature of tires when going over certain terrain. Like that's some that's something that the pe the people who are going to care about that are in the point oh oh one percent. Yeah, definitely. And I think that uh, as game designers, you know, we very much have to consider all the time the realistic factor versus the fun factor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, th these are choices that we make every step of the way. And, uh, you know, I I'm not... I'm not too much of a rule of cool guy, unless it's something very cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, I see. I see what you're saying about the the game thing. But certainly, t being too realistic can definitely subtract from the experience. Oh, I remember. I remember the developers of Eco um, talking about why they an why they um, animated every all the movements by hand when a lot of people thought that they were using mocap and the reason given was that doing was was to them um doing mocap would make things too realistic okay is that the game uh with that woman in a black suit um going through um like a marble room or something no eco okay it was developed by the same team that would later do Shadow of the Colossus. Um, ah, Ico! Okay, yeah, I know, I love Ico. Sorry. <laughs> I love both the... I, I used to call it Ico, and uh, I don't know if it's called Ico, but I love I, uh, Ico and Shadow of the Colossus. Sorry. But go ahead. You can... But they had, but they had animated all of the, move, all of the um, movements by hand instead of using mocap. That's crazy because it feels like a ragdoll. I remember, you know, moving. A, was it Yorda? I think the yeah. girl. Um, I remember moving her, and it, it felt so much like ragdoll. Mm. Um, yeah, okay, very interesting. <laughs> Good to know. Which it, I'm glad it is definitely for the best for, because um, I've I've had to I've had to do uh, mocap mo in the past, and. <laughs> just all the different all the different ways to f to um fall was was a was a lot more painful than people would think cuz it's <laughs> not it's not like I'm it's not like I'm falling on a bed or, or something like that I'm fall I'm falling on ca on carpet floor and just doing that over and over and over over the course of uh, over the course of hours I started to get headaches it takes a toll <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, it does. And the but and since since we since we, it was mentioned, um, I suppose this would be a good a good opportunity to discuss um, mythic talents. Now, when it comes to the acquisition of, of them, is it a case where you get them you get one talent every rank, or is there a cert is there a certain um, schema in terms of how often you are acquiring slots for mythic talents you get them each time you move forward in your mythic path so each time you rank up mm -hmm. so with the mythic path having five ranks you have four choices for mythic talents mm -hmm. uh, it is noted that they are optional so groups that consider it um, that the, the characters are getting too complex can opt to not use them though that is a shame <laughs> because they, their design is to add more flavor to the character mm -hmm. to differentiate one warlord from another for example to make sure that what you have created is unique to your concept and it plays in a unique way that you enjoy Yeah, it's basically how we, exactly what George said, how we can differentiate, you know, you can play the same uh, mythic path twice in a row, and you can have a very different experience through uh, mythic talents. And we also felt that because we also add a feature with its rank up and uh, a mythic talent, we felt that um, 
it's very it, it could be overwhelming for someone first trying out mythic paths and that balanced out by giving them access to mythic talents from their second uh, rank and upwards it felt more natural, more uh, soothing you into a new system. Mm -hmm. Now, the ne one of the big things that is introduced in the system is le is legacy, and I'm cur I'm curious how that system came about and and how do you have it um, working. The reason we introduced Legacy is because mythic characters need to be the center of their story. It's quite often that uh, some D&D uh, &D tales have the players as an afterthought. And through the fantasy of mythic characters, we want to bring them to the protagonist that they need to be. If the centers, if the players are the center of the story taking place, then their actions should reflect upon the world around them, whether that is through consequences or simply how the world reacts to their presence. So depending on the actions they take, the mythic trials they complete, and their their own effort to increase or decrease their fame, they gain, well, exactly that, fame or infamy and titles that affect how the world reacts to them, whether that is gathering funds or their mere name bringing terror to villages and leading them to be abandoned in their passage. Mm -hmm. We also had the very... I think at least very natural way to um, differentiate between being a, a, a villain in one country and a hero in, in another because someone who, for example, is slaying orcs and is famous for slaying orcs could be a hero to a village that was uh, assaulted by or, you know, raided by orcs. But in the orc lands, he would be a villain. And there is a very, I think, a very natural way in differentiating between those two. And the legacy system is actually one of my favorite touches uh, in uh, in the whole book. Mm -hmm. And when when you mention yeah. that differentiation, there's a cup. There, one of the big things that um co that comes to mind is the is um the way characters like say the Doom Slayer or John Wick are seen by different sides. I... Oh, okay. Especially yeah, I can, yeah, I can see that. Especially in the in the case of John Wick, how he's seen as the, how um he's seen equal parts as this legendary figure and also as um the as the boogeyman, even though um <laughs> Even though calling him Baba Yaga is not is not exactly act is all oh, look all of the Russian in the first John Wick movie is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, and I've been told that many t many many times. Yeah, it works to embody that duality as well. Mm -hmm. It really works to encapsulate what a mythic character leaves behind, hence the name Legacy. What will the stories write about them? And it helps the DM envision the now from the legacy they leave behind. Mm -hmm. Envision how they should react to make the world a living, breathing place for the characters. However, the most important part of Legacy and the reason it brings the whole book together is that the later half of it uh, refers to the nemesis, so the villains of the story. Mm -hmm. It helps the DM see how to incorporate the nemesis in the adventure, how often, when would they take note 
of the players. How would they react to their presence? How would they present setbacks and exactly when? So because the legacy is built in this way, you can actually create a whole campaign in very few steps. Mm. You just pick your mythic path, decide which mythic trials are best tackled, and each of them is at least one or two sessions. Mm -hmm. Have that for a whole party, and then see through the legacy system when the nemesis will appear and what they will do in order to stop the party. And you've got a detailed overarching plot mm -hmm. that leads into, as you said, a high level, quite difficult encounters with nemesis who start at challenge rating 16, but go all the way up to 30. Yeah. It's something that, something that I've, that I've always, I've always pushed back against this idea that you, that you can't or shouldn't do high level play because look at the, look at the myths and legends, folklores and, and the characters within them. Um, a lot of a lot of those aren't do, aren't doing are doing the low tier murder hobo that ever that everybody thinks you're supposed to. Um, like we've we've mentioned we've mentioned several larger than life characters th throughout the, throughout this interview. Um, each each of them aren't exactly level one, level one characters. If you catch my drift. <laughs> <And> yeah, <laughs> because of the fact that those are ingrained in the in the zeitgeist, um, people who are coming into are gonna are gonna want to play that kind of thing, and then when you tell them that that that's a bad idea, that's gonna create problems. I'm not sure I understand. Um... It's it's more it's more the fact that with this idea that you that you should that um it that you can that you can and should do do epic or myth or mythic types of play is a, is reflective of the fact that those that those sort of myths are ingrained in in cultural zeitgeist all over the world and coming into something like a fantasy tabletop RPG um, I think people are going to want to invoke are want to invoke that so it creates a conflict when people say that you should that you shouldn't which is why I'm glad that, why I'm glad exordium is going to exist because we need because I think the hobby needs that needs pushback against that um, kind of thinking that mm -hmm. you know of em of embracing Instead, instead of rejecting myth for for focusing on a lower tier approach, treat the treat the idea of mythology as a um, sandbox to explore. Yes, I think I get what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, it's also something we had in mind when creating this book that we do our best to equip both the players and the DM with ways they can envision this and create through this. So not only just mindlessly pick the strong option and murder hobo your way around town, mm -hmm. or just simply call upon uh, a, a very well-known figure of history such as Hercules and just try to become that character without seeing what it means to become that character. Mm -hmm. That's exactly why we created uh, an entire chapter dedicated to try and explain these ideas in an evocative way so that as the DM or the player reads, they can also imagine along with us. And given given that, uh, especially 
especially regarding regarding certain myths. I'm get. Do you get? Do you guys have? Do you guys have plans on, on ad on addressing the types of items that are that are sometimes given to, uh, mythic characters. Uh, that is something that we have touched upon, uh, especially in the part about how you gain uh, mythic power, because many myths involve these uh, magic item that grant you this power and also give you a task that's very well. It's very important mm. to the myth. It's a very exciting trope to explore. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet explored this by simply including statistics for magic items, but there are significant mentions about how to uh, incorporate them uh, from the source of mythic power of a character to specific items that might grant um, a, a rank up, let's say, on a mythic path, mm -hmm. uh, if they are according to that mythic path. Mm -hmm. So that you find something thematic to your mythic path, and that is the thing that increases your uh, character's legacy, your legend, really. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also very happy that we actually managed to complete uh, one of the stretch goals, which is the Wonder Maker. So the mythic crafter who has a whole, well, a whole story to tell about uh, involved with these mythic items. Yeah, that that certainly makes that certainly makes sense. Now, with that with that in with all of that in mind, uh, I'm I'm not expecting a full on a full on advent a full on adventure module. But do you do you have plans in, at points in the book to have a kind a kind of um, story seed to to help people make? Their particular campaigns lean more into mythic. There are um, there is a chapter in the book that um, well, basically it's a whole book about that. <laughs> the whole book is about that. But there's a, a chapter in the book, and uh, correct if my if correct me if I'm wrong, George. But I think that it's one chapter. It doesn't span uh, further. That uh, allows you to um, it gives you guidelines on how you can tackle. A mythic campaign and what's the difference between a normal campaign and uh, a mythic one and that's basically the book is basically a, um, a complete toolkit on how to turn everything in your story uh, to something mythical from making mythic characters to making mythic war mythic worlds through world building um, encountering mythic antagonists in the form of the mythic nemesi, mm -hmm. and uh, also even en enchanting or enhancing maybe uh, normal monsters to be mythical and have an extra an extra touch that makes them more not only more of a threat but also give them more substance. And uh, we have a guide that you can turn basically every monster into mythical. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, because it's a whole toolkit, we have included a lot of examples of how to use it. Yeah, we definitely. have included uh, tables of mythic quests that you can tackle that should take a whole mythic part in order to tackle them. We have included sagas, which are short descriptions of entire mythic campaigns so that you can see how it all meshes together and really I'd say that each mythic trial can serve as a, an adventure hook. Many of them describe tales of going into ancient ruins in order to free them from the darkness for the exemplar and resanctify them for example or 
doing a ritual to venture into yourself and fighting your own sins and your own doubts. Mm -hmm. So you can find a lot of ideas for different adventures. And I think that there's more than a hundred of them. We want those who pick up the book to be ready to use it and ready to imagine immediately. Yeah, basically the book is brimming with ideas and and we phrase things in such a way that we do not just tell you go kill a big bad guy, but we give you a seed of inspiration, as George said. The trials themselves are phrased in such a way that they give you a full-fledged on uh, mini-adventure. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, what do you guys... Um, what would you guys estimate would be the total page count for the book? Well, that definitely depends on how many stretch goals we can get. Um, we have calculated that it should be at least 250 pages, but that number, you know, may grow. Um, but it, it will fall uh, between 250 and... I think 300 would be a stretch, but it should be around there. Mm -hmm. I'd say with the way stretch goals are <laughs> being fulfilled, we might be looking towards 300. Each <laughs> mythic path is six pages or longer. Its nemesis is four pages or longer. So <laughs> we have a lot of extra content to write uh, from where we left off the book. Mm -hmm. I mean write down the stretch goals. Yeah. Yeah. And I I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. <laughs> it has been uh, excellent. Mm -hmm. And it has been enlightening. Thank you for the invitation. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> yeah, sounds sounds great. Uh, let's hope that you get to meet the full team. And I hope next time we can uh, discuss about how we broke every stretch goal and uh, <laughs> delivered the book and everything went well. <laughs> um, hang on a moment. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he he did the magic thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, we'll go with that. Um, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the, took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! What an outro. <laughs> <laughs>